grow. What is God's plan for you? To grow. To grow. It's God's desire for us. It is God's will for us. It is His plan for us in whatever situation or surrounding we find ourselves. It is God's plan for us to grow. And these last few weeks we've been looking at the how we grow but if you'll remember last time, it's now been about three weeks or four weeks because I was in the U.S., Pastor Renee has been preaching and he very graciously um, uh, agreed to continue preaching last week when I had jet lag really badly. Um, and so it's been a while since we've come to this, but I want to remind, we want to remind ourselves, remember we took a slight, not a detour, but just a, a, an emphasis um, a few weeks ago when we looked at this, although we're talking it about how we grow, we don't want to remember, forget, we want to keep in mind why we grow. Why we grow. And why do we grow? Why does God want us to grow? Because each one of us in this world that is sinful and fallen, each one of us has been scarred by sin, each one of us has been marred, each one of us has been broken, each one of us the enemy has tried to give us a plan that's different from what God's plan is for us. And God has come into this world. God, through, his, through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God Himself, came into this world to redeem us and to buy us back and to make us into what He has planned for us to be. If any person is in Christ, he or she is what? A new creation. Old things are passed away and behold what? Everything is new. All things are new. When we invite God to come into our lives, He comes into our lives. And He doesn't just say, okay, I'm going to come in and help you. The Bible makes it very clear. He comes in and He makes His home. God the Holy Spirit. So God the Father sent God the Son. And then God the Son went back to heaven and God the Holy Spirit was sent to live in our hearts. Not just to walk with us and to uh, be with us when we need help or here or there, but to live in us. And the Holy Spirit comes in and what does He do? He gives us new spiritual DNA if you want to think about it in that way. Before God the Holy Spirit came into our lives, we did not have the ability to change ourselves. We didn't have the ability to be any different than what our enemy, the devil, planned for us to be. But then God came in and He changed us and He gave us living spiritual DNA. And because of that, with His spiritual DNA, as we work with Him. And as we cooperate with Him, He begins His work and He helps us to grow into and to become the people that God has planned for us to be. The God who loves us, who planned and who purposed for us to become. We've talked about this before, but I want to remind you of that again. So it takes the guilt out of it. It takes the guilt, it takes the, uh, the burden out of it. Like, oh, I know I should grow because that's what, that's what we should do. It's what God wants me to do. And instead, we see it as the potential and the possibility that God has for us when He comes in and He gives us new DNA. Now, some of us would say, yes, but sometimes I don't feel like I have new DNA. We're going to talk about that this morning. Sometimes we don't want to read our Bibles. Sometimes we don't want to pray. Sometimes we are still drawn to things that are not the best for us and they're not good for us. And yet we still have new spiritual DNA. What is going on? We're going to talk about that a little bit more this morning. Um, but God has put His spiritual DNA in us. And we read in 2 Peter verses 1 and 3, we've talked about this before, His divine, divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Here is part of the new spiritual DNA that God gives us. As we see this, this is the NIV. The New Living Translation is a little bit different, but I really like the NIV here 
But we see this, when we look at this, we say, okay, but I don't feel like I have everything I need for life. I don't feel like I have everything I need for godliness. But if we go a little bit further in here, you will see, and we're not going to look at that this morning, you will see that Peter writes, but we have these great and precious promises. Promises. And so we go a little bit further. Let's look at the next, next one. The, the things that God... Sorry, I'll get started in just a minute. The things that God gives us for life and godliness... Then he talks about in 1 Peter 2, the first part um, of verse 2, he says you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. And so what God gives us, what is available to you and to me in growth, comes in the form of promises and potential. Okay, let me say that again. It comes in the form of promises and potential. It is not yet possession. Got that? Okay, so there's the promise. There's, there's, the, there's the potential of who you can be in Christ when He gives you his, his spiritual DNA. It's His spiritual DNA in you to help you grow into that. So there is that spiritual DNA and the potential is there. And then there's the promise of God that says, I've given you everything you need for life and godliness, but it is not yet possession. It is not yet possession. There are some things, brothers and sisters, that God will give to us as gifts. What is one of the most important things that God gives to us as gifts? Salvation, right? Salvation. What does it say? It is the free gift of God, for by grace you have been saved. Okay? And it's the gift of God, not by works, lest any one of us should say, Oh, look at me, lest any one should boast. And I love that. I'm so glad that salvation is a gift because we could work and work and work, but we would never work enough because salvation is so great. We could never work hard enough to gain salvation. And so he gives us that gift. But not everything is a gift in our Christian lives. So we have potential when we come to the Lord. We have the promises of the Lord, but they are not yet possession. And growth helps us to possess the promises of God as we fulfill the potential that God has for us. Do you know, I don't yet know all God has for me to be and, and to do. Do you know that? I don't yet know all that God wants me to do. I know some of it, but I don't yet know all of it. But as I get to know God better and better, and as I grow, do you know what happens? I begin to see more and more. I begin to understand more and more. Oh, God, this is what you want for me. God, this is what you have for me. And I want to say that this is true for everybody from the youngest person here to the oldest person here as well. You may, say, you may uh, remember what, what Blessing wanted to be when she grew up. She wanted to be a princess doctor, right? She wanted to be a princess doctor. If she will let... I don't know if she's going to be a princess doctor or not. But if she will let... God work in her life and work with God, she has the potential to be the best princess doctor of anybody, <laughs> if you want to think about it in that way. And I want you to think about it in this way as we look at this, as we grow up into the full experience of salvation. I've just used her as an example. But I want, to think, I want you to think about yourself. Who are you and what are you this morning? We look at this and sometimes we think it's, it's, it's all spiritual things. I'll be like Jesus. Now that is true. When we grow, we grow into, we become more like Jesus. That's one of the things that happens in our growth. But I want you to see it as in addition to the spiritual growth. Do you know what spiritual growth will do in you? Spiritual growth in you will also make you the best husband you can be. The best wife you can be. The best student you can be. The best employer, employee, business person, teacher, you will be the best that you can be as you grow spiritually 
as you grow spiritually, the best mother, the best father, in all of these ways. Because when we grow in God, you see, do you think that God's plans for you are, are spiritual only? Those are the greatest plans. But God has plans for you that are part of this life, and they're part of this world. He brought that person into your life. He made you. He brought you into the family that you're in. You could have been in any family. God brought you into that family. And He has plans for you and purposes for you. You're working a particular job this, this day or, or here in Hong Kong. Do you think you just happen to be lucky and that's the job you got? Don't you think God led you into that? He wants you to be the best that you can be in that job, to do the best that you can do. And as you grow in Him, that potential will be realized as we grow into a full experience of salvation. So, and this is a wonderful motivation for us. Not a guilt motivation, but an encouragement motivation. Amen? Does that make sense? So, there are, there's potential, there are promises that are not yet possession. And as we grow, we possess what God has for us. Right? Right. Now, how do we grow? Is it just going to happen? No. Next slide. We grow by choosing to grow. The Christians who grow, if you're taking notes, take a note on this one. Christians who grow will be Christians who choose to grow, who are intentional about growing, who say, I don't want to stay the same. I want to grow. I want to change. When the Holy Spirit speaks to me about something, when I see something in the Word of God, I respond to it. I take it into my heart and into my life. And as I do that, I begin to grow and I begin to change. People who grow and mature and become fruitful will be the people who choose to grow. Can you make yourself grow? No! You can't make yourself grow. So what does this mean? We choose to grow. But who makes us grow? Paul was very clear. Who does it? God makes us grow. Because it is a spiritual thing, isn't it? And who can make spiritual things happen in our lives? I can't. I can't. Only God can do that. But I can say, God, I choose to grow. God, I'm going to create the environment and do what I need to do and cooperate with you so that I will grow. And that's what we're talking about. So we're going to grow if we choose to grow. But it's not going to be through our self-effort. It will be our cooperation with a supernatural God. And in fact, it will be our natural cooperation with a supernatural God. Right? That's how it's going to happen. It will be the Holy Spirit working in us and the Spirit giving us life. Now, as we talked about this before, let's look again. All types of growth. Next one. All growth requires what? Nutrients. Okay, we're growing. What do people need to grow? We need some air. We need some sun. We need some water. We need some food. We need some candy. No, we don't need any candy. We don't need any candy. We want candy. That's not, that's not going to help us grow. What about these flowers here? Do they need this, exactly the same things? No, they need different types of nutrients. They're going to need some other type to grow. What about um, an oak tree? Well, an, an oak needs particular things to grow. What about a banana tree? Well, a banana tree needs other particular things to grow. What about if you have a pet, a cat or a dog? Cats have to have meat. They're carnivores. Um, what about if you have a, a Liz, Steven, Big Steve. Do you still have a snake? No, you have a wife instead, don't you? Which is better? The wife, okay. That was one of the things that Steve got rid of. To gain a wife, he got rid of a snake, okay. But those snakes had to have certain things, right? What did you feed them? Rats. You talk to him about it later. We won't go into it here. But that's what they needed for growth. So they needed nutrients for growth. And other types of things need other nutrients. Does anybody, do you know what I have found out? Pollyann, I'd forgotten about it. Pollyann and Lau have this great fish tank, okay, with all sorts of beautiful fish. Pollyann, is it yours or, or Lau's? It's, you, it's yours now. Brother Lau has gone off and left the fish, right? But there are certain nutrients. Now, we couldn't throw a rat into the fish tank. 
<laughs> That's not what the fish need. They need other nutrients, don't they? So all growth requires, and that's just an example, all growth requires nutrients. And if all growth in the natural requires nutrients, we've talked about this before, spiritual growth requires nutrients as well. So if we're going to grow spiritually, the next one, Lauren, if we're going to grow spiritually, spiritual gr growth requires the nutrients of, and we began talking about this, what are they? What's the first one? The Word, okay? So the nutrient that we need for spiritual growth, some of you are saying this is basic, Pastor Jennifer, yes it is, but this is a good foundation for us. The, the two nutrients, now there are other things we're going to talk about that help us grow, but here are the two essentials, and one of them is the Word, the Word of God, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more this morning. The Word of God, and the second one is what? Prayer. Prayer. Communication with God. Talking with God. May I say something? Don't get scared by this one. Some of us say it's hard for me to pray. I don't have a lot of time. I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and I want to pray, but I fall asleep. How many of you fall asleep when you get up at 5 to pray? I do. I, I got really spiritual one time, but it wasn't really spiritual. It was the flesh. It wasn't spirit. And it was when I used to work, it was when I was living in Beijing, and a, a friend of mine started getting up. The Lord really convicted him. He started getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning to pray and read the Bible, but re really mostly just to pray. And he would go to bed at 9 o'clock and then he'd get up at 4. And I heard that and I thought, ooh, I want to do that. It sounds really good. And so he said, okay. But he said, okay, I'll call you at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so he'd call me for the first week. He called me at 4 o'clock in the morning and I'd get up and I tried so hard to be really spiritual and to pray for an hour from 4 to 5 when nobody else was up. And it lasted about four days. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> We can be encouraged by what others do in prayer, but you don't have to copy what other, peop other people do. Just be encouraged, but you do what you can do. And I want to encourage you as well when it comes to prayer. Some of us feel like, I can't really pray because I don't have an hour to pray. If you don't have an hour to pray, then start with what you do have. Do you have a minute? Pray. Do you have another minute some other time in the day? pray. Do you have a few minutes on the MTR or on the bus as you're going somewhere? Then take some time to pray. Now I'm not saying that's all you need to do one minute here and one minute there, but start somewhere and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But these are the nutrients that are required for growth. They, they, it requires the Word and it requires prayer. No great mystery. You know, Pastor Renee and I, we talk with people all the time and we meet people all the time who want the secret of Christian living. Have you ever talked with people like that? Have you ever wanted the secret that will change your life? You know, that if, you, if I just find out this secret, then my life, my Christian life will be transformed. Do you know what I think? There aren't really secrets like that in Christian living and Christian life. It's pretty basic, I find. You go to the Word of God and we learn new things, but it's pretty basic. You want to grow? Start taking the Word of God into your life and start communicating with God in prayer. And those are the basics. No great secret there. If we're going to grow, we must have fundamental spiritual food, and it's the Word and prayer. Now let's go back to 1 Peter 2.2, 2, and we've talked about this before. Like newborn babies, shall we read this together? This is what a wonderful verse it is, verses 2 and 3. Shall we read together? Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. And let's look at this. We talked about this a lot already, but there's still a few little gems here that we haven't looked at yet. So I want us just very quickly this morning as we continue to look at a few things. We ended with this verse last time, but I want us to look at a few other things. And I want us to look at this really strong word. Uh, and by the way, I, I, like the word, I like the word picture that Peter gives us because he's talking about babies that are newborn, milk, and then cry out because that's what babies do when they're hungry, don't they? When babies are hungry, do they just sit there quietly and blink, feed me? No, 
They cry, don't they? They cry. And so there's this great picture for us, and it's a very simple picture, isn't it, of, this, of a little baby that's newborn that, that wants milk, that is hungry. And so this is the picture he gives us, but let's look at it. And let's look at this really strong word, crave. And what does crave mean? Crave means to intensely long for and to desire. And that indicates a strong heart hunger. Now, stop right there and I want to ask you something that will surely make you feel guilty. Are you ready to feel guilty? How many of you crave the Word of God? Crave. You really, all the time, really, you're just, your heart is hungry. You're just craving. I want to read the Word of God. I want to read the Word of God. Forget the newspaper. Forget the internet. Forget Facebook. Forget the latest show on television. I just want to read the Word of God. Edmund, now I feel guilty. Edmund, <laughs> Edmund raised his hands. Because I need to prepare the daily, Bible, the daily bread, so I need to. Okay. Well, he says, I need to. That didn't sound like crave. I don't know. We see this, and we start to feel guilty immediately, don't we? Because we don't really crave, do we? Do you know why we don't crave often? There are good reasons and bad reasons for it, I think. I think sometimes our mouths are full and our stomachs are full of other spiritual food. I do think that. And I want to say something to you. If you love watching television a lot and movies a lot, and if that's what you do a lot all the time, I'm not trying to condemn anybody this morning, but I will say this. If that's what you feed on a lot, or like gossip magazines and this and that or whatever, things that, that, that don't have eternal value or permanent value, I will tell you this from personal experience. I think that when we really fill our lives with that, we often don't crave the Word of God. I, do, I have found that to be true. Have you found that to be true? And sometimes those things, they're not bad things, they're not terrible things, it's not pornography, it's not whatever, Al although some of those things I think can start us walking and looking at the ways of the world and we don't want that. But what I just want to say is this, when we fill our thoughts and our stomachs and our minds in, in a sense, with the food of the world, it will lessen our hunger for the Word of God. It really will. And, and so I want, to, I want to encourage you in that. If you say, I understand what you're saying and I want to be more like this, then I want to challenge you and encourage you. Try cutting out some of these other things and saying, okay, God, I don't want those things that are not awful, but if they take the place of my of your word, then I don't want to do that. Start trying to cut out some of those things. So I think that's part of it. There's another part about it as well, and part of it is that we still have a fallen nature. Though we have spiritual DNA, we still live in this world and in, in this body that is, that, that is a fallen, it's an imperfect, it's an imperfect uh, um, situation, and sometimes because of our sin nature, we just don't crave. We just don't crave. So what do we do what do we do when we, when we don't crave? Do we go with our feelings? Or do we tell our feelings, you are not the boss of me, and I'm going to feed on the Word anyhow? That's what we tell our feelings. When you don't feel like doing something, when you don't feel like praying, when you don't feel like reading the Word of God, you know what you do to yourself? Just pick yourself up on the back, you know, right back here, and say, feelings? You're not going to be the boss of me. I choose to read the Word of God, and I choose to pray. People who grow in God will be the people who choose. It will not be the people who feel. Okay? It will not be the people who feel. Because sometimes I will feel like it, and sometimes I won't. But my feelings cannot be the boss of me. My choice determines the way that I go and what I do. So I just want to encourage you and challenge you. But Peter says crave, intensely long for, and desire. And I encourage you, if you will do this, do you know what will happen to your taste? You will begin to crave. Um, for me, let me give you just a, a, an earthly example. I love... Coke Zero. Love it. Love it. But you know what? I don't love it as much as I used to. I used to drink 
one Coke Zero every day, and sometimes two a day. Steve, you too, huh? No. Some people really hate them. I loved Coke Zero, and you know what? The more Coke Zeros I drank, the more I wanted them. One, one a day wasn't enough. Two a day, mmm, that's great. And then sometimes, maybe in the afternoon, I'm going to have one more Coke Zero. But I realized it's not good for me. It's not good for my teeth. It's not good for my body. It's just not good for me. And so I started cutting back. And as I cut back, do you know what? I still craved it. I wanted a Coke Zero. Oh, I wanted a Coke Zero. And then I started cutting out. And I started telling myself, no, nope, you know what? I can have one Coke Zero a week. And I would have a Coke Zero on Sundays. Now, I think this week, I can't have one today because I had one on Thursday with Pastor Renee <laughs> and, and Melrose. So I've, I've had my Coke Zero for the week. But what I found was this. As I cut back, then my craving began to change. My craving began to change. And you know what? A lot of times I drink now what I, I'm happy to drink. Oh, I want some water. That's what I've got in my cup right now. I want some water. And if you will do that, that's just a natural example, but if you will begin to do that spiritually, you will see a difference where you will crave the Word of God. Now, what comes next? Then Peter says, you will grow into a full experience of salvation. But do you know what it means exactly in the original? In the original, it means the pure spiritual milk will grow you. Isn't that great? If you choose, God, I'm going to feed on your word, the pure spiritual milk of the word will grow you. And I love that. I love that. And it, it tells me, it reminds me of the power of the word of God. The power of the word of God. And then the last one, what's that other word? Pure spiritual milk. And pure means unmixed with other things unmixed with other things, not people's opinions, not people's ideas, but it's the pure spiritual milk of the Word of God. We read Christian books, we read Christian biographies and autobiographies, we listen to testimonies, and these things encourage us, and they are good things, but always find a place for the pure Word of God that's unmixed with anything else. And as you do, you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Honestly, brothers and sisters, and it's, we're coming to a close this morning, and I didn't get nearly as far as I wanted to, but I want to just take about two or three minutes as we close this morning. And I want to, to just encourage you and exhort you and prod you on further this morning. I believe, in general, that the Christian church underestimates the power of the Word of God. I'm not talking about imbalances where people say, I speak the Word and I make things happen. And I'm not talking about that, the imbalances in there, but I'm talking about the Word of God in our lives as we take it in. I think most Christians underestimate the power of the Word of God as we bring it into our lives and as we obey the Word of God. Paul says, or James, not Paul, James says, receive this word of God into your lives, into your heart, and so into your, to your life. It has the power to save you. It has the power to do everything that God has planned for it to do. I want to tell you something. If the only word of God you receive, listen carefully, if the only word of God you receive is Sunday mornings when Pastor Renee preaches, or Pastor Jennifer preaches, you will not grow. Let me say it again. You say, oh, but Pastor Jennifer, you're a great preacher. Pastor Renee's a great preacher. We receive so much. Doesn't matter. If you are not receiving the Word of God on a consistent basis in your life, the Word of God as you read from other people, taking it into your life, and all you're getting is a Sunday morning sermon, you will remain a weak wimpy Christian that will fall when temptation comes, that will live in fear when the enemy roars, and who will not understand God's plan for your life. But if you will take in the Word of God, Acts 20, verse 32. Acts 20, verse 32, the next slide. Look at this, as, and we close with this this morning. This was Paul 
And you say, what does that have to do with what we just said? It's a wonderful verse. This is Paul saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders, the church that he loved. Oh, he loved these people. They were the most mature Christian church of Asia, the church at Ephesus. And uh, Antioch was for a time, but anyhow, at, at Ephesus. And he tells them, he's saying goodbye to them, and when Paul says this, he believes that he will never see them again. He believes that he's going to Rome and he's dying. Um, he's going to be, he's going to be uh, uh, killed for his faith. Now he doesn't. He does see them again. He has another missionary trip, but he thinks it's the last time. And look at what he says. He says, now I know that I will never see you again, but then what does he say? And now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace. Uh, another translation says the word of his grace that is able to what? Build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. Paul understood the power of the Word of God. Imagine that. Here's Paul the preacher saying to a church that he has helped to establish, I'm never going to see you again. Brothers and sisters, if Pastor Renee and I were to say goodbye to you, I'm afraid I'm not quite at this level yet. I would be thinking, are they going to make it? Can they make it? We're not going to be there anymore. We're gone. We were their pastors. What's going to happen to them? But I trust that God will bring us to the place where we understand and when we, and we will see that the message of His grace and that the Word of God is enough to build you up and to give you an eternal inheritance, to build you up for now, and to keep you into the future. This was Paul's final message, and he said, I entrust you to God and the message of His grace. I take you and I put you in God's hands and the Word of God. And if I do that, and if that's where you stay, you will make it. Wolves will come in, but you'll make it. The enemy will attack, but you'll make it. You will be persecuted and thrown into prison, but you will make it. False doctrine will come and false teachers will come and they will attempt to deceive you, but you'll make it. Your enemy, your, your family may disown you and betray you, but you will make it because I've committed you to God and the word of His grace and it is enough to build you up and give you an inheritance. This is the power of the Word of God in our lives. And if we will, we will grow. We will grow. We will grow. Let's close in prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Lord, we look to you this morning. And Father,